Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 380. Today, I'm sharing with you an interview I did with Press TV. Now, you're not going to believe this, but Press TV is actually an Iranian television network, and I was interviewed some years ago by them about my book, Nullification. Well, anybody who wants to hear about Nullification, I'm glad to talk about it, so I think you'll really enjoy this interview that I did with them. On the show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 380, I will link, of course, to my book, Nullification, which I hope you guys enjoy, but also to a special free resource I set up, Nullification FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions About Nullification. You can reach that directly at nullificationfaq.com. So all that stuff, if you don't remember it, will be at tomwoods.com slash 380. Also, of course, you can get the audiobook version of my book, Nullification, and you can get it for free if you haven't already gotten a free audiobook through TomWoodsAudio.com. Nullification is one of your choices there. Also, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, Rollback, and then, of course, my book, Real Descent, I Read Myself. Those are all available. You can grab one of those through TomWoodsAudio.com. Here we go. Tom Woods, thank you for joining us here in New York. My pleasure. I'd like to start off uh, from the very beginning, because some of our viewers have never come across uh, the term nullification. What is nullification, historically speaking, and who are the creators? Well, first we have to understand that the United States, when it was established, was established as a collection of self-governing communities. That's what it was. So it was customary to speak of the United States in the plural. So you would say the United States are a nice place to live. The emphasis was on this collection of self-governing societies. That's what the American War for Independence was about, that each of the colonies wanted to be a self-governing society, but the British government wasn't allowing that. So when they established their own government, obviously they didn't want to undermine the self-governing societies. That was the whole point of breaking with Britain. So in the U.S. Constitution, in 1791, there were ten amendments that were added to it, known as the Bill of Rights. The Tenth Amendment says that any power that the states, when they created the federal government, any power that the states did not delegate to that government remains with them. So any power that's not mentioned in the Constitution is presumed to rest with the states. Well, nullification simply derives from this point, the further point, and it was Thomas Jefferson who really codified this idea, that if the federal government does try to exercise a power that's not listed in the Constitution and that rests with the states, if it does go beyond its constitutional boundaries, then the states would be bound to resist this act of the federal government, and therefore, within its borders, the state would nullify that act. And the U.S. Constitution was sold to the people of Virginia by taking these uh, aspects into consideration. Th that's exactly right. Uh, this is hardly known, I would say, among the American population. If you found even 1% of the population that knew, frankly, what I'm about to tell you, it would be amazing. But Virginia was arguably the most important of the, of the original states because so many of our important statesmen came from Virginia. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, John Marshall, Patrick Henry, George Mason, major figures in American history all came from Virginia. The Virginians were very skeptical about the Constitution. So in 1788, when they were being asked to decide whether or not to ratify it, skeptics like Patrick Henry were saying, this government outlined in the Constitution is going to grow to a level at which no one will be able to control it. It will have no practical limits. And so supporters of the Constitution assured Henry and other skeptics, don't worry about it. This government will have only the powers expressly delegated to it. And if this government should try to reach for a power not delegated to it, don't worry. Virginia will be exonerated from that action. So there really is, in germ, the idea of nullification. And Jefferson is really is simply drawing it out in 1798 when he really spelled out the idea of nullification. You were quoted as saying that it's going to be a lot harder to get the kind of media for this book that I have gotten for my many other books. Why is that? The, the, the idea of nullification is not a popular one. I mean, most Americans have never even heard of it. But anytime you emphasize anything involving the states and the powers of the states, American students, school children, 
have been taught to believe that anybody advocating this must have sinister intentions, that the only reason you could advocate this is that you want to use these powers of the states to oppress minorities and so on. Now, nobody doubts that the states can be oppressive. Any government can be oppressive. That's, that's not the issue. The federal government can be oppressive too. The federal government threw a couple hundred thousand Japanese Americans into concentration camps during World War II. And it would have been nice to nullify that if the states had had the backbone to do it. But the point is that today, in 2010, in the South, you do not see the problems that you had in 1960. Blacks are moving to the South. They're not moving away. They're moving to the South. That's where they actually find that people treat them reasonably well. Uh, blacks are not moving to New York, by and large, uh, these days. And not just because it's impossibly expensive to live in New York. So, but the, nevertheless, there is this presumption that anyone who favors local self-government must have some sinister agenda. And that is exactly the opposite of the truth. Every dictator who ever lived has always opposed the kind of decentralized arrangement that is our birthright in the U.S. Either you have a system in which there's one giant jurisdiction and you just hope that liberty is preserved there, or you have a system with a bunch of competing jurisdictions in which people can leave if one becomes too oppressive. I think the second one, in the long run, in which different states are competing to see which one can have the most livable, most desirable society, I think liberty is much more likely to be preserved there over the long run. What was the main driving factor uh, when coming out with this book? Was timing of essence as well? Well, it's interesting. I was working on a totally different book, and then suddenly I thought, I should do a book on nullification. Like, I, I'm such a ridiculous workaholic. Like, I, I'm already working on a book. Let me work on this one. But, but the reason I did it was that I noticed that a lot of people were starting to talk about it. And my videos, just that I've done as a historian on this topic, are starting to be viewed by a lot of people. And people are talking about it. And, and I, I never imagined that this would come up again. I, I figured this would be a dusty old historical issue. And I like dusty old historical issues. And that's fine. But I didn't think it would be a live issue once again. And then when I see that uh, across the country on a variety of issues, on both left and right, there are some states saying, you know what, we're just not doing this. Like, like you know and I know this is not in the Constitution, so we're just not doing it. So I thought, this is a healthy thing, that we're restoring a humane scale to our political life. I mean, one regime for 309 million people, that is inhumane. And so to restore some kind of human scale to political life, I thought, this is such a wonderful thing. And so this movement should have like a kind of handbook, because it will be demonized. Again, people will assume these are wicked, terrible people. They need to have a book that tells this forgotten history, that, that defends what they're doing, shows how purely American it is, shows how moral it is, how constitutional it is. So I decided, let's get this thing out. But again, let's get it out quickly. The, the, the sooner people have it, the sooner they can act on it. And frankly, I'm partly a little concerned that if the president does not win re-election in 2012 and instead is replaced by some Republican, you know, middle of the road hack, you know, just like we usually have, that all this momentum behind wanting to push against the federal government will disappear. Because a lot of conservatives will think, well, we have one of our own in the White House now, nothing to worry about. A lot of people still think we've got a, a vibrant two-party system. It is, it's shocking. But if the other party gets in, I'm afraid the enthusiasm for this will disappear. So I wanted to get this out quickly while people are still frustrated with the government. In Nullification, How to Resist Federal Tyranny in the 21st Century, Woods explains not only why nullification is the constitutional tool the founders of the United States envisioned, but how it works and has already been employed in cases ranging from upholding the First Amendment to knocking down slave laws before the Civil War. Some of the issues Woods talks about are how the states were meant to be checks against federal tyranny and how a growing roster of governors are recognizing they need to become that again. Why it was left to the states to uphold the simple principle that an unconstitutional law is no law at all. Why, without nullification, ordinary Americans will continue to suffer the oppression of unjust, unconstitutional laws. How hasn't the strategy of giving full authority to federal government not working? Well, I, I think people never really consider the alternative. They think either the federal government should impose this kind of educational standard or that kind of educational standard. It never occurs to them, should the federal government impose an educational standard? I mean, isn't that implicitly saying that people are too stupid to run their own schools? I mean, this is what it means to be a self-governing person living in a self-governing community. 
your community makes decisions for itself. And sometimes you might make stupid decisions, but at least, therefore, the fallout of your stupid decision is limited. What if the central government makes a catastrophically bad decision? There's no escaping it. So at least here you can let a hundred flowers bloom. This place does something stupid, or this place taxes the population too much, well then those people leave, and places that leave people alone get rewarded. So on net, other governments are gonna to wanna to imitate that one. Whereas in the United States it is so centralized, that ability for one, little, one government to compete with another one, and be an alternative, an example, a counterexample to others, it's just rendered inoperative. And so we have this situation now in which we have a government that's completely unresponsive to the people. That, uh, I mean, in fact, early on, you know, I've got the statistic in the book about the number of representatives we have now. When the U.S. Congress first opened its doors, there were about, there, were, there was one representative for every 30,000 Americans, which was 5,000 voting citizens. It's now one representative for over 700,000 Americans. So, if we had that ratio in 1791, we would have had four people in our House of Representatives. And every four years, we have this low-intensity civil war to see who gets to control everything, who gets to dictate to the schools, dictate the agriculture policy, dictate to the whole country. What if we could just have an alternative to this? So even, regardless of whether it worked or not, it's just not the kind of life that I think if people were given the choice, they would choose. But the fact is it isn't working because right now the U.S. government is so remote, so unresponsive uh, to anyone other than people with money and people who are lobbyists that we now have a system in which our old age uh, program Medicare that provides medicine for uh, uh, medical care for older folks and Social Security are so underfunded that it would take an additional, on top of the money we spend on it now, an additional $100 trillion dollars to make them actually sound and that that figure comes from the head of the Federal Reserve of Dallas Richard Fisher and yet in spite of this overwhelming tsunami that's about to hit the US government continues making promises and continues printing up money and handing it to people as if nothing's wrong if if most decision-making power had been left in the hands of Massachusetts Vermont Florida there is zero chance that we would be in a situation like this absolutely zero because at least there the people have some modicum of control. But because of centralization, we are now in a situation in which kids, I mean teenagers, people in their 20s, are going to have to work harder and harder and harder just to stay still. They will never be able to retire. Their lives are going to be completely ruined because of all these impossible promises that are on their backs. No, the thing has to be smashed. To quote Robert Murphy, a friend of Woods, the surprise in the book is chapter four, what is or are the United States anyway? Here Woods makes a compelling argument for the compact theory of the Union, which is the view that the federal government was created by the individual states when they ratified the U.S. Constitution. The nationalist view holds that the people of the United States collectively formed the central government and that therefore the individual state governments are subordinate to it. There really was no competing theory, spelled out, systematic, competing theory to the compact theory until about 1830. So this was the theory. Um, and it, it, we associate it with, with Thomas Jefferson and people who followed him, but the compact theory says that the United States is a compact among sovereign, self-governing states. That the United States is not fundamentally a single whole. It is the United States, not the United State. That the states retain their independent character. And again, that's the whole point of the separation from Britain, was that we wanted to have self-governing communities under the military defense umbrella of a single central government. Now that is, of course, the model that we've been moving away from for quite some time. But nevertheless, the evidence, and as I think I show in, in nullification, is just overwhelming. Probably the most obvious and clearest piece of historical evidence on this point is the manner in which the Constitution was ratified. We didn't have a single vote of the American people in the aggregate. We had votes taken separately in each of the states. And in fact, Rhode Island did not choose to ratify the Constitution for two full years after it had already taken effect over some of the other states. So each state was separate, independent, and James Madison said that if a state had chosen not to ratify the Constitution, 
then there would have been no political relations subsisting between us and them. Today, of course, we have moved completely away from that model, but I think that model has much to recommend it. The whole world has moved toward strong, centralized governments that do not have any competing jurisdictions within their boundaries. And what have we gotten? A whole lot of debt, a whole lot of unsustainable spending, uh, a huge overhang of government programs that are crushing the ability of young people to get jobs and to, to prosper. So it, it does seem to me that uh, these things are all tied together. Won't breaking the government in different states at this point in time when there is already a sense of tug of war, so to say, between the two parties on so many issues create chaos and ultimately lead to secession? Well, I don't know. I, 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 when nullification was, was suggested by Jefferson and then later by other American figures, by and large they thought of it as an alternative to secession that it was the moderate middle ground between secession on the one hand and complete submission on the other. So nullification was thought to be a way that you could stay in the Union and enjoy whatever benefits that brought, but yet at the same time resist something that you believed was unconstitutional. So nullification could in fact help to hold the Union together. But at the same time, if, nullification is kind of a last resort. I mean, the, the fact that we are resorting to it means that all other options really have failed at this point. So it's very hard to say what, what, what the future will hold, but at least up, I, I think we can find enough issues on which left and right agree that, you know, whatever our own opinions are, the federal government has nothing to do with this issue. They should leave us alone to make our own decisions. I think there are enough cases of that that we can peacefully push off the federal government and say, don't worry, you have enough problems to worry about as it is. Leave these matters to us in the states. We're not a bunch of stupid rubes. We are self-governing individuals as Jefferson wanted us to be. And has the government been receptive in addressing uh, the issue of nullification or perhaps when it's uh, questioned, how has it responded uh, when, uh, when at one point or another a reporter, for example, comes out and says um, this law that's being passed is not constitutional? Because I know in the very beginning of your book um, you have a story of when um, the U.S. House Speaker was asked the question how she responded to this issue. That's right. The Speaker of the U.S. House was asked to justify from the Constitution how she could get away with the health care legislation, and you would think she could at least refer to some clause, or I mean, even if it was a stretch, say something. Instead, she said, what, are you serious? And then just laughed. Well, that's not really a, it wasn't really a stupid question, right? Sort of legitimate question. Where, and, and again, it should not be hard for her to at least come up with a, at least a silly answer, some answer. But uh, the idea of nullification is that it forces them to take account of the Constitution, that you can pass all these laws, but if the people aren't going to obey them, then what are you, are you going to send tanks in to Texas or Maine or New Hampshire, really, because, because of medical marijuana or because of uh, a gun issue? I mean, really. So nullification, in a way, is a, is a kind of way to, to say to the federal government, look, you want us to do this, we're not going to do this, so now what? Isn't the Supreme Court responsible to stop the federal government from passing laws that are not constitutional? The Supreme Court has a role to play. Now, Jefferson's view was that the Supreme Court was largely an advisory body because he did not trust giving any number of, of unelected people the final word on the meaning of the Constitution because then they would be running the country. More than that, though, he feared giving the federal government a monopoly in general on interpreting the Constitution because then it will keep uncovering new powers for itself. Um, the problem with the Supreme Court is not only that the Supreme Court is not an impartial arbiter, but it's also that the Supreme Court has to accept a case. The, the Supreme Court could decide, we don't even want to hear this case. And so then there could well be an unconstitutional act. If the Supreme Court won't hear it, then what recourse do the people have? There must be something beyond this. And in his famous so-called report of 1800, James Madison said, that we have to have some mechanism to protect our liberties in those cases in which even the judicial branch is not a, a, an appropriate or a, a responsible sentinel for our liberties. And where does the signing of memos fall um, in your discussion considering the fact that there, uh, since the Reagan administration onward there has been the signing of these memos which reached its peak during the Bush administration and then was rolled back so to say during the Obama administration where the president basically 
uh, feels that, that a certain law is not constitutional and it writes it off and it signs it off. Well, there are, uh, there are two issues that come up in what you've discussed. One of them is called a signing statement, and that really peaked under George W. Bush. So that is when the president goes to sign a bill into law. This used to be just a purely ceremonial affair. You know, the, the Girl Scouts come there and, and everybody's smiling and he puts a signature to it. But George W. Bush really pushed forward an innovation whereby in the statement attached to his signature, he would say, oh, by the way, I really think that Article 2, Section 3 of this is uh, an unconstitutional constraint on my power, so I'm not going to enforce it. But usually, these were perfectly constitutional constraints on the president's power. But he would just sort of say, well, I just don't think I'm going to enforce this. Now, historically, the understanding was you either take all of a bill or you take none of it. I mean, that was, and there are, there are reasons for that. But if he doesn't like a provision in it, he vetoes it and he sends it back to be redrafted. He can't pick and choose. But that's what began to happen, was that, you know, if I want to torture, I'm going to torture regardless of what this says. Uh, if I want to give money to some overseas uh, war and I'm told I can't, I'm going to do it anyway. That, even John McCain, who was hoping to be the Republican successor to George W. Bush, even he said he wouldn't do that as president. So the signing statements really uh, were important. But, but also there's the executive order which is the idea of the president basically just going ahead and making a law. Like he feels like the Congress won't support him, so he'll just sign it into law without congressional authorization. And that's been done a number of times in American history. It really picked up in the 20th century. There are some times when the president can do that. Like if the president pardons someone who's guilty of a crime, he does that through an executive order. That's fine. The Constitution gives him the authority to pardon people. But what if he basically exercises a congressional power like, what if he imposes a new tax without consulting Congress and just institutes it as an executive order? Well, a lot of times, he has done that. The president, uh, during World War II, there was a brief moment where Franklin Roosevelt imposed on his own a 100% tax on all income over $25,000. Well, eventually, Congress intervened and said, now wait, you cannot do that. But what usually happens is, once something has been enacted by a president, now well, people get used to it, or the Congress will eventually reconcile itself to it. So it's a very dangerous thing. And finally, the supporters of your work and idea have termed your latest work, Nullification, uh, to be a gem. But what is your message to those who have not converted, so to say, and who argue that the ideas that you pose are very in line with conservatism, and the Tea Party movement and, and taking the United States back, so to say, um, to the Bush era, perhaps? Well, I don't think anyone anywhere in American life has talked about decentralizing power for years and years. I mean, certainly, I didn't see any power being decentralized under George W. Bush, Mr. I'm going to go to war on my own say-so, I'm going to uh, engage in warrantless wiretaps and listen to your phone conversation. I mean, does that sound like a guy who wants to turn power over to local communities? The neoconservatives are probably my biggest opponents on this. They, they argue for a so-called national greatness conservatism. So the idea of states dissenting from the federal government is utterly distasteful to them. So they and the mainstream left will be arm in arm against me on this. But the old-timey, old-fashioned left, like uh, my friend Kirkpatrick Sale, who years ago wrote a book called Human Scale, in which he said, business is too big, agriculture is too big, government is too big. It's just on a scale that's just not appropriate for real human life, face-to-face -face interaction. And so he, he thinks, yeah, we've got to cut this thing down. And yeah, in my community, we're going we're gonna to socialize the cost of a lot of things. And in your community, maybe you won't. But I live in my community, you'll live in yours, and we'll both be happy. All right, everybody, that's the episode for today. Remember to check out the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 380, where you can get resources related to this episode. And remember, if you like these episodes, if you're listening to the show regularly, then you will really enjoy my new book, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. Find out more about that on the special site I set up for it, Real Descent. Dot com. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.